Well, James, welcome to Equity Mates. Thank you. Good to have you back. Thanks very much. So we want to start off with um, your investment approach. How would you define your investment philosophy? Look, the investment philosophy is really, it's quite based on numbers, but it tries to be very balanced because when I started at Fidelity as a PM, interviewed a whole lot of PMs that have been around for 20, 30 years, and they said, look, just always try to be balanced. Don't try to be extreme, extreme quality or extreme momentum or extreme value because that's where you get caught out in the cycle. So my process is therefore a very balanced uh, perspective of quality, value, transition and momentum, and that's how the portfolio is structured. Um, but it is very balanced in that sense. It's 40, 30, 20, 10 across those kind of groups. Um, and the psychology is very much like your brain as a human being thinks quality gets you very relaxed. I'm in love with the stock. It's high ROE. It's high return, high growth, high multiple. It's all good. And as your brain goes into these different, I guess, paradigms of, of, of investing, quality, value, transition or momentum, you get caught up with certain blind spots. So you've got love spots and blind spots because everything's going well, but then it also blinds you to what can't, what doesn't go well. Um, so for me, that's why it's, it's always try to be balanced, but then always be aware of the positive and negative in those four quadrants. So quality, uh, value and momentum, people will likely have heard about before. Yep. Um, you know, quality is, I guess, the, the, the aspects of the business, the, yep. like, the long-term sustainable yep. competitive Pirates. advantage. Yep. Value is about the price that you're paying versus what you're buying. Yes. Momentum is the share price movement. Yep. I haven't really heard a lot about transition. Transition is a positive and negative group. So the negative groups are quality, uh, fallen angels in quality and fading momentum out of the momentum group. And then you've got the positive ones, which are catalysts that sit in transition, but they have real catalysts that you can see. So it's so like it's, a, cha a change in the business. Positive changes, yeah. yeah, positive. So the negative changes are fallen angels and your fading momentum stocks, and the positive change is, yeah, your, your real turnaround stories. Okay. So it can be restructuring, cost cutting, some big things that are visible, and often management provide you with milestones. And that's how you classify that in that group. Yeah. To put you on the spot, is there a recent example that like a stock that yep. is in that quadrant? Yeah, so there's one really good one was Texas Pacific Group. It was actually a, an oil business in the US and it was a, an old, boring like trust basically. Um, it was very established, hadn't been challenged for decades. Um, and then it turned itself into a company through an activist. I um, mean, going from a trust to a company, it, with the board all changed. They became more shareholder friendly. And um, the stock went up 300% <laughs> nice. on that catalyst. <laughs> wow. right? And yeah. it was very visible. So there was an activist, activist got a block, activist changed the board, activist said, right, got to be shareholder friendly. And then everything right. just happened, the rest was history. And it went up 3x. It was obviously when oil was going well, but that was a tailwind. But still, it was it was the structural change of that um, yeah, wow. that caused that movement, and that's what a classic transition stock is. And we'll be in them for typically twelve to eighteen months. Okay. Um, and they'll be typically three X. Typically wow. three X. Yeah, that's that's, <laughs> what, that's what the history's been. <laughs> Heard There's it five first. examples of that. And what, wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. Okay. Nice. So uh, you are the co-portfolio manager of the Fidelity Global Future Leaders Active ETF. Yes. Which I think is exciting because. Um, last time we spoke, it may not have been an active ETF. No, it no. was just the fund yeah, at that stage, yeah, yeah. the Aussie pool. So that, we love that, more accessible for everyone. Yes. Um, and we, I guess we want to unpack some of the elements of what makes a global future leader because we're all, that's what we're all looking for. We're yes. all looking for the next, um, next big thing. Yeah. So there's a few elements that we pulled out when we were researching um, this uh, episode. Mm -hmm. A strong, strong competitive positioning sustainability of business model and reinvestment runway. Yes. And so we want to take them one by one and sort of get your thoughts on why they're important and then also how you find those um, features in the companies you're looking at. Yep. So let's start with strong competitive positioning. What are the hallmarks of a strong competitive position and what are the signs that a company has it? Perfect. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. So typically it's, it's small market structures. So small market structures where that you could basically fit the I say you could fit the industry on the palm of your hand. Okay. So when there's a problem in the world as a human being, a company or an organization, you want to solve a problem, there's only five places or five companies in the world that you'll go to. So Red's Med's a good example of that. Some brands in the world are like that. Some um, technology providers are like that. Mm. Um, and some service providers are like that in terms of industrial service providers. Um, and in many cases, there is deep elements of trust. 
and deep elements of history that allows you as a human being or a corporate making a decision to allow you to go to that place and feel comfortable that that is going to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. Mm. That's typically the characteristics. How you see it is is the return profile. So high ROEs, very steady growth, very high what we call persistency or consistency. So your ROE, return on equity might be 15 to 20% for like a decade or sometimes two decades, mm. which is very rare actually. They're quite rare. And in our universe and in the Aussie universe, qu true quality is around 12 to 15% of the listed market. It's quite small. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they're one in seven to one in you know eight companies in the world. Um, but you'll see that very consistent return profile. Remember the average Australian company or even global company has an ROE of about eight. Yeah. There's like one and a half to two X that. Mm. But to have it consistently is also quite rare. So that's how you get to those sort of lower ratio numbers. Yeah. And I guess to unpack that, the reason why <coughs> the high, uh, consistently high ROE is a sign of strong competitive positioning is uh, competitors haven't been able to come in and uh, take that market share or Correct. reduce prices. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So they have pricing power, uh, depth of trust, depth of relationship all these things depth of time mm. and they're things that you can't just create yeah they as a human being you go to those companies because they've they've proven to you as a buyer over a decade or two that they can do it yeah um whereas yeah developing an app or something that's short term it can't give you that kind of profile yeah yeah what about it when it's the other way? You're, you're looking at a company that's trying to break into an industry where there's only five, you can count them on their hand. Like yep. you're looking at an industry that has strong competitive advantage because mm -hmm. there's only so few. Someone's trying to bang on the door and get in there. Like yeah. how do you look at that and assess that company? It's usually a momentum stock that's trying to get into a quality business. Um, but that's something you've got to be aware of when you think it's a great quality business. Like as a quality is like a long-term marriage, you think it's beautiful, it's protected, it's <laughs> kind of going to keep you safe at night. But this is business. It is competitive. People are trying to eat your lunch every day of the week. People can try to innovate their way into your market all the time. So it's typically a momentum player or a disruptor that's trying to break that quality kind of moat. Yeah. Um, and that's how you'd look at it. And look, th that does happen. Mm -hmm. Like that does happen. Mm -hmm. And that's the, just the nature of, of business. And yeah. Humanity is, is very innovative. Mm. Um, so obviously a lot of tech companies that have innovated and broken through very established networks so you've got to keep your eye on that because like i said a high quality business you can be blinded to those things but they do happen mm. how do you assess the the sustainability of a business model yeah pretty much sustainability you got to look at the esg elements first so there's modern slavery and diversity and making sure that they're treating their employees and their sort of market structures right secondly there is um the sustainability of how they treat their customers and and really suppliers um, and that is a function of, um, f for us, it's like five to 10 years of a sustainable return profile means that they are doing that. Okay. But it needs to be five to 10 years because otherwise it, it really is too short. Uh, but the sustainability is very, very important because that means if you can do it for 10 years, you can generally do it for 20. Um, but if you can't do it for 10, there's either a cycle or it's not as not as great a moat as you think, mm. um, or you're doing it in a way that's not sustainable. So that's either your, 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 your kind of your, your environmental ESG kind of credentials. Um, and that they are, they are very important. If you want to buy, especially a quality business that you think is five or 10, 20 year investment, it's very important. Could you bring this uh, sustainability of business model idea to life by a company that you think doesn't have a sustainable business model one that you looked at <laughs> and you're like mm, no nah, there's something here where i'm like i'm not super interested there's a lot of tech companies that have been really high flyers so things that are up five to ten x at the moment in our in our universe that that they have a concept which is working but the history of it it may be only four or five years old or they may have made losses two years ago and today they're making a billion dollars <laughs> right yeah, yeah, and yeah. you just think that doesn't really define sustainability to me. It, that's momentum. Mm. It's successful. There's no question about it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be making a billion dollars today. Um, but if the, it makes a billion dollars today and it made losses two years ago, then what's happened? Mm. And is that billion sustainable? And that's really, I guess, what you've got to ask yourself. So when, yeah, that's why that is real momentum. And yeah. that for me, it, it defines momentum. But they can, they can really get into the... Um, quality market and really disrupt it so you've got to be you've got to keep your eye on them all the time 
when you're looking at small caps though, like the time period that you have with some of them might not be that they've had 25 years of history, history to yes. look at. So yes. how do you then weight a sustainable business model against, you know, this is a, a, a company in its early years. We're yep. looking for future leaders here. Yep. True. Uh, and, and, and sort of the play and the dynamic. There. Yeah, no, it's a very fair point. I'd say the, look, the Aussie market, and I've done studies on this, I call them toddlers, like look at the toddler index. So how many of them are under three years old? Literally nice. three years old. Um, and when markets are hot, that can get up to 40% of the market, which is wow. a huge oh, wow. number. Okay. And the average age might be between sort of five and say 15. So they're really young to, to teenagers. Um, in our market, because it's a bigger market, it's between five and 50 billion US. These are much more mature. So 30, 40, 50. Um, one of them we own now currently, Montclair, is 70 years old. Right. So that's quite mature <laughs> yes. compared to... But you, like, it's a very fair point you make. And you do have to, um, when you are fight, finding future leaders, you do have to be aware that momentum may come and momentum may be innovative. And you need to acknowledge it that 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 visibility is something that you might only be able to see in the future, not right now. It's not rare, but stocks can go from like, from, from we transition momentum to quality. It does happen. Mm. Um, you need to be careful that it's not cyclical, mm. but if it is structural growth and it is innovative and it is like you're talking about disrupting the quality sort of cluster that exists today and in the past, and it's something that's gonna be the leader of the future, hence the future leaders, then you need to just acknowledge it. And you need to buy some of those things, like we do own some of those things that were early stage. Um, it's just that they're not quality when you look at them, but they may be quality in five years from now. Yeah. So yeah, it, it takes a bit of trust in management and understanding of the market and thinking about what they actually offer the market to actually accept that that is what will happen in the future, as in you can't see it now, but it will happen. Mm. I mean, in our lifetime, we've seen plenty of companies go from transition to momentum to quality. Not, yes. not necessarily small caps, but like the biggest company in the world, yes. Apple, was yep. transitioned with iPhones, like a yep. new product, completely new business, then momentum, they yep. ripped. Yep. And Massive now, market share. Yeah, now yep. they're quality. They also still seem to be momentum. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, does mo it does happen. And that's, a, that's why you need to keep an eye on it. And yeah. uh, you need to be aware because your brain needs to shift and you think, oh no, it's too hot or it's momentum, so I'm not going to own it. Mm. Like, as long as your brain has the ability to move and, and also look a few years out as well, mm. it's very important to do that. Otherwise, you will miss a lot. Yeah. I guess the, the real analytical framework, the, like the analytical challenge would be when to move. Like, I'm thinking about the hottest stock of the moment, NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. Like, transition happened, uh, AI became a thing. Yep. Momentum is well and truly here. Yeah. And like, there would be people that argue that NVIDIA is quality. But it's like, is it or is it just still riding a momentum wave? Yeah, that it's out of our point? out of our market cap lead. Yeah, I'm not asking but, you to. Yeah, to but the question that, is, yeah. the question <laughs> is still there, and you got to look at what the PE. What is again? You come back to what is sustainable. Mm. What is a sustainable return profile? Um, is it short term? Is it cyclical? Is it structural? And you got to ask those questions, and that's what you got to do in your head. Doesn't matter what market cap or any, if momentum to quality, you got to put those questions into your head. Is it structural? Is it cyclical? Yeah. What is sustainable, and how long is that duration? period like yeah, is yeah, it three yeah. years five years ten years twenty years um if you can get comfort that that is a five to ten year duration and that return profile will be 15 to 20 that is actually a quality business yeah, yeah. and sometimes it doesn't it's not of it's not always obvious not always mm -hmm. obvious mm -hmm. and that's what um that's why you got to just keep your eye on these things and, and and watch and ask a lot of questions because the people in the industry know basically what's possible and the market will have its own dreams and aspirations uh, but what, the more you talk to people in the industry, you'll get a better feel for what actually is real on the mm. ground. Yeah. So. so the third element was the reinvestment runway. Yes. So I think what we want to understand here is how do you know if it's just a small, profitable, nice little business yep. like Equity Mates or, um, <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or it actually has the potential to reinvest effectively yeah. and grow into a global future leader? Yeah. It comes back to like adjacencies of product or adjacencies of markets Excuse me, or scope of market. So a lot of them are obviously American based or European based and then they're going global. Um, but once they have a runway which allows them to either go into adjacencies in product or adjacency in markets, they will continue to reinvest in that. And as long as that reinvestment rate can be at the same sort of 15 to 20% ROE and they're not getting to 
what you call diseconomies of scale. So when you're, say, an Australian retailer and you have maybe 100 or 200 stores of a certain concept um, and then you go into 300 or 400 to maybe get rebates or scale from your suppliers, that's getting into diseconomies of scale because you start to get a lower incremental return mm. profile. Mm. But if you are genuinely innovative, uh, wherever you come from in the world, even Australia, and you can go into product adjacencies or market adjacencies, and invest at that higher return rate, then you've got a, a pretty, you know, a pretty amazing business. And you've had it here domestically. You've got realestate.com.au, um, James Hardy, ResMed, um, Car Sales, and Seek have all, you know, a lot of them have gone global and they've reinvested at, at double digit rates, fifteen to twenty percent ROIC, um, Wise Tech. So a lot of these companies have been very successful globally. Um, and global future leaders, very similar to the domestic future leaders, is they are European or American companies that typically start on the east or the west coast or Europe central and then start to go all around the world and mm. export their concept. And when you do that, it's, it's amazing how many years you can have. Um, like I mentioned, Moncler is 70 years old, but the, most of the companies are around 20 billion or 20, 30 or 40 years old. And they've had this runway for 20 or 30 years which is phenomenal because mm. um, most companies on the American market the average lifespan is actually about 15 or 16 years yeah. so to actually reinvest for almost twice that for these successful companies is quite a phenomenal start mm. Mm. it's a challenging one because uh, when you're trying to assess like a domestic business that's super successful time and time again we've spoken on the show about these plenty. companies that <laughs> yeah, say they yeah, want to yeah. grow and yes. product adjacencies and yeah. some of the examples you spoke about yeah and then it's just an almighty fail and they yes. wind it down and come back to just so I guess trying to f that that's I guess the point of your job is to find the yeah. ones <laughs> it is. find the ones that it's, do well but it's it as yeah. as an investor if you're like all right it, it makes sense what they're trying I'm going to put my money with them and then lo and behold five years later it's all been a bit of a disaster yeah, there's been so. plenty of australian companies go offshore and come back what i say with a tail between their legs yeah, mm. yeah. and then write off a billion dollars or two yeah. so um so are there like traits that you've identified that kind of you can you can recognize that they are going to do there are traits yeah typically they go a bit smaller and they do it organically um they're typically the ones that do better and they're very niche actually similar equimates it's very niche like it's a real specialist there's a deep element of trust or a deep you know, element of specialization they're doing something a bit different um, and when they do that and they do it kind of slowly in a new market and then they get accepted and then they start to penetrate that market, that's really how you mm. basically become, yeah, globalized. Yeah, nice. Mm. Um, whereas if you try to make a big acquisition, that typically doesn't work well. Most of the, those with tail between their legs have done big acquisitions and they call it transformational acquisition and then it just doesn't work. Mm. Um, so mostly organic is better. When I think about reinvestment, like reinvestment can come in multiple different forms. Mm -hmm. You've got like a, a res med, which is like we've got something that works and we're just going to take it global. Yep. Um, or, you know, you've got a wise tech, which is like we're going to acquire and we're going to acquire and we're going to acquire. Mm -hmm. And for wise tech, it's worked. Mm -hmm. uh, or you've got like a, an ordinate who's like we've got a product adjacency. We're good in audio. We're now going to try and do the same in video. Mm -hmm. Are there like particular forms of reinvestment runway that you prefer to see? Like potentially like the ResMed, like we're just going to take what works and make it global or like do you, will you take reinvestment in any form and it's like about the idiosyncratic company execution? Yeah, that's no, a good, it's definitely very important to think about this. And the key thing is what you said, ResMed, that's the easiest and the lowest risk format is, is following the same product but exporting it into a different market mm. ge geographically where there is a need, genuine need and you are doing something different and therefore the uptake is generally quite high. Yeah. Um, and in particular for ResMed, there's a big element of trust. So um, that's the biggest one. If there is a big element of trust or a big element of specialization, that tends to be where the success rate is the mm. highest. Um, so like ResMed, for example, that one, you know, if anyone of us or kids or partners or friends go into hospital and ICU and we need oxygen and they want to give you a mask, they're going to give you probably one of four on the planet one of four in the planet. Like mm. that's, a doctor's not going to say, oh, that one's 10% cheaper. Let's give that one a go. It doesn't work like that. Like a doctor's there to make sure you survive and you need oxygen. So give me the mask that's going to work and it's going to be one of four products on the planet. Mm. That's like, wow. Like, and if you export that into a different market, it's going to be the same thought process that goes on in your brain as a human being. And therefore the outcome's going to be the same. So that's the lowest risk. 
when you go into yeah new markets with new products, that's when it's a bit more risky. Yeah. And then if you do M and A, Wise Tech's a bit different because it's going onto the same platform. Yeah. But generally, that's the higher risk format. But if it's going onto a platform and it's going into a whole lot of s the same processes, which is what Wise Tech's done, then that that's why that works. Mm. But generally, the the acquisition model is probably the highest risk. So you kind of got those three, three sort of high risk, medium risk, and then low yeah, risk yeah, yeah. kind of approaches. Yeah. yeah. So James, we want to uh, do a bit of a deep dive on a couple of stocks in in the fund to kind of illustrate the philosophy that you've you've just spoken about. Mm -hmm. You've bought two today, ResMed and Moncler, both of yes. which you've um, you know alluded to throughout this conversation. So mm -hmm. let's start with ResMed. Uh, can you just give us a, a quick refresher on what the company does? Mm -hmm. So ResMed uh, works in, I guess, airways management systems so they'd have a seat different markets but there's CPAP um, and they yeah, basically you use masks that's what they do um, so when you need oxygen in ICU or you have um, sleep apnea then you'll need these mask kind of systems um, it is very unique in the sense and they also made an acquisition uh, that provide a lot more digital and a lot more um, like app type formats so you can get a lot more data as a, as a customer and as a doctor to, to track what's actually happening um, again, it's a great business. I love it. It's, it is high quality. Like I said, you can fit that industry on in the palm of your hand. There's only probably four or five in the industry that actually does that. And doctors kind of trust them quite deeply. Uh, high ROE, uh, large moat, very steady return profile, very consistent through COVID as well, quite consistent. Um, and that's why, yeah, I've, we've owned that one or bought it recently because of GLP-1 sort of fear and scandal of GLP-1 <laughs> has meant that stock had fallen fall quite a lot, yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. Um, but those markets are still there um, and they are sort of going through that recovery phase in terms of multiple. Mm. Mm. So, as you said, uh, pretty well-known business. Mm -hmm. um, but what was the moment when you thought, oh, there's something here, I might want to add it to the fund? I've had it in the Aussie fund for a lot of years um, and that was just really the opportunity, the GLP one that made it a lot cheaper So it was, that we it was bought a, it in the global fund. It was a price story. Yeah, it was yeah, a price story yeah. for, for ResMed, but it because it all ticked the boxes on market structure and all that, that's why it was yeah. quality business. Yeah, and for like, people who aren't super familiar with that story, it fell about a third correct. because there was all this fear that these GLP-1 drugs like Azempic would reduce the amount of sleep apnea as people were losing weight. Yep. And so, you know, uh, companies like ResMed were sold off. Mm -hmm. But then since then, it's rebounded pretty strongly, hasn't it? It has rebounded. And the GLP-1 phenomenon, it's still around. Mm -hmm. I just think the fear of it and the, I guess, the clear runway of it, you know, creating such a very significant impact on obesity um, and sleep apnea has now been, I guess, that fear has been moderated and that's meant that ResMed has been allowed, I guess, to recover by the market mm. in terms of multiple. Mm. Uh, and so we've been talking about like long-term reinvestment and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And I'm just looking at their, their price chart and their price is sort of similar to pre the GLP-1 scare. Yeah. So was the thesis... I just want to own it until it recovers or is there a long-term investment thesis? We're happy to own it longer term yeah. now because it is it is a long-term growth story. It is a, you know, a captive market, a high quality business. Um, and yeah, we still like it longer term. So we yeah. still own it. So it's still holding. What are the risks to it then if you're, if you're thinking about, well, yeah, what are the risks for, to it? Risks are always competition um, and also reinvesting. And when you start reinvesting in that, that reinvestment rate starts to fade. So you can't find reinvestment options that give you a higher return. You end up reinvesting at a lower return. If we start to see those things, then you start to get more worried. And then you start to question that quality paradigm in your head that maybe, maybe it's not as great quality as you think. Or maybe that sustainability runway is shorter than you think, mm. which is what the GLP-1 fear was all about. It brought it in. Mm. So instead of being a 30-year story, maybe it's only a 10-year story. Yeah. Um, so that's where I think you still need to be, you know, listen, really listen to management and see what they're saying. Uh, but then also listen to doctors um, and see what they're really saying about the product outlook. And that's, I guess, what you need to keep looking out for. Mm. Mm. So for, for context, uh, I've just pulled these numbers up from the National Institute of Health. Yeah. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea affects approximately 20% of US adults, of whom about 90% are undiagnosed. Yes. And like for me, that's always the stat that stands out when we talk about uh, sleep apnea, just the amount of people that have it mm. and the amount of people that don't know they have it. Yep. And so for me, it's like, why aren't ResMed reinvesting mm. in Ads. a massive <laughs> outdoor <laughs> advertising campaign? Yeah. 
Are you sleeping you poorly? Sleep. Yes. Twenty percent of adults have sleep apnea. Yeah. Get tested today. Yeah. Like, that's your <laughs> reinvestment plan, right? It's there. a very fair point because yeah. your penetration is the key thing. A lot of us, the hearing's about the same, like for cochlea and things like that as mm. well. Um, but for resmid, yeah, they, sh they it, it's just awareness. Yeah. It's just awareness yeah. of these things. Um, and you know, so my dad uh, has a resmed CPAP machine, and yeah. like his sleep is heaps better. And yeah. it's like the amount of people that it could be sleeping better. Yeah. It's crazy. To and there's, yeah. Yeah, there's other benefits, like it extends your life, extends your health, reduces yeah. a lot of other health risks as well because your oxygen levels do fall very low for a period and then they come up again. Mm. Well, you stop breathing. Yeah, you stop breathing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's fundamental yeah. oxygen to yeah. the brain. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it, it is a, it's a big awareness campaign um, that they could keep investing. And that's what, it's a really big penetration story. Mm. Um, yeah. All right. Well, ResMed, if you're listening, <laughs> we're happy to be your marketing guys. Yes. <laughs> so that was uh, one of the two stocks. The other stock was Moncler. Yes. That's a luxury um, European brand, very aspirational, you know, two, $3,000 jackets that are very functional, very fashionable. Had origins um, giving, actually making a Moncler jacket for guys that were conquering a mountain. Uh, many years ago mm. and has now become one of the icons of uh, if you wanted to kind of conquer the mountains and, and survive in the very cold conditions. Uh, Moncler is a very chosen brand. Uh, it's very fashion forward as well. So it's sort of over time has become a lot more fashion forward, but also a lot more functional or they call it technical in the mm. industry. So it's technical, functional and also fashionable. Um, but the prices they pay are like they're up there, like two, three thousand pound jackets um, are very expensive. And that's why it's been around for 50, 60 years is a phenomenal brand, um, very aspirational. And its return profiles are quite phenomenal, you know, 20, 30 percent return profiles um, and fits in all of that sort of LVMH kind of product range or product suite or product psychology of that kind of um, suite of assets. Uh, but it is separately listed and as you know set up by the founder and is still a founder-led business and by the family so so a, a business that's 60 70 years old mm -hmm. quite mature um like what's the what's the growth profile over the next decade what are you in like where do you see this business going Growing? yes yeah. it's a fair question so obviously with most fashion items to have one sort of lead product and then they go into accessories so you accessorize the range and that's what they've done so that over the decades they've accessorized the range to give them a more more product range uh, but you fundamentally need a new demographic group mm. to continue to grow mm. which in in their case is really uh, european wealth uh, but then also Asian wealth. And the Asian wealth has been the biggest source of growth, incremental growth for the last about 10 years. Right. So it really is about those wealthy um, Asian markets uh, in China um, that are moving upwards in the wealth mm. um, sort of scales. And then they're using aspirational products, much like the consumption of Ferraris and BMWs. Um, Moncler is no different. It's in that luxury camp where they are aspirational products for those that are in those wealth categories and going up the ladder. Um, and they are being consumed by those markets. Mm. I want to jump in on that answer and, and, and also offer an answer to Bryce's question. I've just pulled up their financials. Mm -hmm. Last five years revenue, uh, these are in uh, euros. Yeah. 1.4 billion euros five years ago. 2.98 billion euros five years later. So it's doubled. Doubled, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. What do you expect over the next 10 years? Or that compound yeah, double digit growth rate has been what they've done. That's what we're expecting them to do from European growth and the Asian growth market. Um, and then that's the revenue line. And then you've got ma you know, margins being maintained and yeah. sometimes they're incrementally growing depending on what product range they have. Uh, so that's pretty phenomenal. Like as a business, that is quite phenomenal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just even to get double digit top line growth on a like that's five years but to do it over 50 is is mind-blowing yeah um and then to actually hold your brand and, and and present that in a marketplace where it's still desirable every year every year for 50 60 years it's quite phenomenal what's that profit so it's it quite consistent yeah. yeah it's quite consistent margins five, five years ago it was uh 332 million euro uh, and then 612 million euros. So, about so it's quite as well. consistent. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So, um, yeah, so very steady. That's what was <laughs> that quality mm. sort of comment that we spoke about before. He's just very steady, very consistent, and very persistent. So, like, you look at that over 10, 20, 30 years, it's very persistent yeah, across yeah, those yeah. time periods, which, like I said, is, is phenomenal. Like, in, in a world where everyone's trying to eat your lunch and trying to compete, innovate, and, yeah, these momentum stocks come in with new ideas and try and create <laughs> new things, um, it's quite phenomenal to, to be able to, to see a company like this over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years just doing that double digit, double digit, double digit, yeah, double digit yeah. returns, top line, bottom line. So if that's the thesis that it's got like a strong brand and strong market position, it's opening up new markets and, and new customers in terms of like a younger demographic in Asia. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's expanding its range with new accessories and stuff like mm -hmm. that. What are the risks to that thesis and, and what are you really monitoring as an investor to be like, that's going to be a red flag that my, yeah. I myself. Yeah. Typically with these luxury brands, it's um, some sort of a scandal. So look, much like any healthcare or engineering or consumer product, there's a lot of trust in the brand. And if consumers lose trust in their brand and respect for the brand, they effectively lose respect for themselves consuming that product. Mm. So whether it's um, a scandal in terms of how they run their business, so they have a lot of like ESG awards, Moncler, um, in terms of cotton, sustainability and et cetera. So those things are very, very important for their business. Uh, but if there is a scandal on either supply um, or employee treatments or some sort of where there's credibility lost, anything along those lines, typically it's supply or product, um, then that's when you start to lose credibility. And what happens first is, is honestly, it's happened so many times, earnings will come off 10%, but the multiple can come off 30 or 40. Mm -hmm. So then you, your stock literally halves yeah. um, and it's only on 10% earnings. So there's a lot of this, a lot of these quality businesses, especially a lot of it's the values in the terminal value, which is in the future. Um, but the multiples are high generally because there's a big trust element. Yeah, that'll be sustainable over years. So when the answer, when that comment is not sustainable, <laughs> then that can be a stock can go from thirty times to fifteen yeah. in, in a flash. Yeah, um, and that's what you need to keep your eye out for. So you got to watch what management says, what they do, particularly what they do <laughs> or what they say. Um, so their behaviours. Um, products they bring out, controls that they have on their brand, controls on their suppliers, controls with their employees, how they treat their employees, etc. So all these things are incredibly important for that multiple to be sustainable and those return profiles to be sustainable. So when they're not, yeah, it's a major problem. So yeah. that's why you've got to constantly keep an eye on these things. Yeah. Now, James, before we wrap up, I got to ask, we're talking about global future leaders here. We can't go past AI. Yes. Are you making any investments? <laughs> uh, we are, but they're, because AI is typically with the mega, the mega cap, so yeah. you need a huge amount of data, a huge amount of resources and a lot of capital. Like some of them are spending, you know, hundreds of millions on yeah. this. Um, so uh, there's not a lot, but there is quite a lot of picks and shovels AI. Yeah. There is a lot of AI within our technology businesses that are either facilitators or users of AI, or they're using AI as an element within their own business. Um, so there is quite a few like nice as a technology, which there is an AI like um, app within that, within that, um, within that business. Um, and there's a lot of facilitation of AI through all the software th yeah. companies that we own, but there's yeah. not a lot of direct AI, AI investment because yeah. most of that is mega caps. Big, yeah. But it's a massive Not quite topic. In the universe. It is a massive topic. And, you know, uh, when you go to the States or you talk to, and it, it's, it's AI revolution is really what it is. And mm. it, it is going to change our world. Um, you know, there's a lot of concerns about it, but it will, it will revolutionize what is done in many businesses all around the world. Mm. Mm. What was that company you said? No, nice. Nicer technology? Nice. N I C E. Yeah. Oh, nice. It's an nice. Israeli technology company. Okay. Um, and they've developed an AI, got an award actually for an AI development program that they did. All oh, cool. right. There you go. Another yeah. one to Google after nice this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, James, thank you so much and congratulations on the launch of the ETF. We've thank had you, you on to discuss the fund before, but the Fidelity Global Future Leaders Active ETF is now available. The, the stock ticker is FCAP. And uh, backed by 50 years of investment experience, Fidelity's new range of active ETFs not only cover the global future leaders, but also India, Asia, and a concentrated Australian equities ETF as well, which puts their 400 investment experts at your fingertips. So for more info, head to fidelity.com.au and uh, everything will be there. But James, 
as always, absolute pleasure. Thank you Excellent. for coming on again. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Thank you. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.